So it's April 24th, 2019. I'm Nancy Gross, and I'm here with Langston Colin Wilkins, who is a folklorist and um, colleague from Washington State. We're going to be talking a bit about his collecting and how he became a folklorist. And he's just given a very successful Botkin talk <laughs> on uh, what it was city folk. Uh, street it? folk. Street folk. Yeah. Uh, ooh, what is it? Hip hop, car culture, and black life in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. And you're from Houston originally? Um, born and raised in Houston, Texas. Okay, well, and at what point, mm -hmm. just to, to start things off, yeah. did you decide you were going to be a folklorist? Whoa, whoa. Uh, well, you know, honestly, uh, that's a good question. I, I can answer it in two ways. Yeah. I feel like I knew this my whole life. You know, even though I didn't really have, uh, I didn't know the word folklore or know the word folklorist for a long time, but I knew I wanted to study culture in that kind of way. But um, I think at some point during my uh, time in graduate school, you know, especially when I started working in more public oriented spaces, I knew that, you know, that's the kind of work I wanted to do. I loved working with people, highlighting their traditions and just kind of affirming their lives. So I think, you know, maybe. 10 years ago is when I realized that, you know, I want to be a folklorist and kind of ran with it, you know. <laughs> so, so walk me through your education. You went to high school in Houston? What neighborhood? Yeah, are you from? I went to high school, middle school, and elementary in Houston. I, I've lived multiple parts in multiple, multiple parts of the city, but I was primarily raised in the south side in a neighborhood called Hiram Clark. Um, we moved there when I was in middle school, and my parents still live there. Mm -hmm. um, Went to Westbury High School, um, not in the neighborhood, but maybe 10 minutes away in Southwest Houston. Mm -hmm. um, then I went to the University of Texas at Austin for my bachelor's, majored in, eventually majored in English <laughs> and graduated in 2006. Um, then I moved on to Indiana University, first in African American Studies. I'm oh, sorry, to which, which Indiana? <coughs> Indiana University. Oh, Indiana, okay. Yeah, and I got my first master's in African American Studies. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a year into that master's, I also got into the folklore and ethnomusicology department and um, eventually got my PhD there. So, um, yeah. Folklore. Mm -hmm. And at some point you ran into um, Pat Jasper? I did. I did. How did that happen? Um, in 2011, mm -hmm. I was preparing to head to Houston to do my field work, and I believe it was Diane Goldstein at Indiana who connected me with Pat um, at the Houston Arts Alliance. They were looking for some sort of fellow or intern to work on African diasporic communities and traditions in Houston. And um, she connected me with them and um, went down there in 2011 and worked with Pat and the Houston Museum of African American Culture for about a, a year, maybe a little less than a year. So. Mm -hmm. And was that your first <coughs> field work? Um, well, you know, I was doing both my dissertation field work and field work for the Houston Arts Alliance at the very same time. So, uh, oh, okay. yeah, so yes, <laughs> essentially it's my first truly professional, you know, uh, deep dive field work. Yeah. And your dissertation was on screw? Sort of. My dissertation um, was looking at music and place. So I was uh -huh. examining um, artists' connections to place of various kinds, so streets, neighborhoods, the city itself, and how though that relationship and that bond is manifested in the musical output. So why does Houston hip hop, how can you see and feel Houston in Houston hip hop and why? That's what I was looking at. So, and I did a year of field work down there just hanging out with artists, talking to them about their background histories, their musical you know, process, and, and why they love their neighborhoods and their city so much. So yeah. This is both South Side <coughs> and North Side. Yeah, it was. Um, uh, most of my field work was probably among South Side artists, just because um, that's why I was living. I went back home to live with my parents, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, the South Side music. That's kind of what I knew most. But I talked to artists from all over the city, from all walks of life. Um, mostly African American, but you know, some white, some Latino. But um, yeah, mostly you know, black guys in the south side of Houston, that's who I talked to. Were you aware, you were growing up sort of in Houston at the yeah. golden age of a lot of yeah. this. Were you aware of it? Were you participating in it? What was your yeah. relationship to it? 
I was aware of it, you know, um, in terms of the car culture slab. You know, my uncle, um, my mom's youngest brother, he didn't have a slab per se, but he had an older Cadillac that he fixed up, put an incredible sound system in it. And I used to just love being, he had multiple Cadillacs that way. <laughs> so I used to just love hanging around him and listening to his CDs in his car. Um, some were screw, other, you know, other forms of Southern hip hop. But yeah, in middle school and high school, I mean, screw was our sound, you know. It's funny, at the time, it wasn't my favorite brand of hip hop, you know. I was deeply into hip hop, but it's not screw. But I think over time, um, I grew a deep appreciation for it, and I just think it was, you know, embracing the culture around me a bit more it gave me that appreciation. And also leaving Houston itself, I guess uh, you're in for home, and the sound of screw reminded me of that and connected me to my city um, when I was in Austin and when I was in Indiana. So it's complicated, yeah. <laughs> to say the least, yeah. What did the people who you were interviewing think about it being documented? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think they really appreciated it. And I think, um, you know, that culture had been documented uh, and studied in, in various forms, mostly by journalists, you know, and folks looking to, you know, publish books about, you know, screw in a very, what's the word, um, not surface level, but, you know, they just wanted to document the sound. But I think um, those artists, I mean, understood where I came from, understood that I was from, you know, those neighborhoods, their neighborhoods, understood and valued that I was an African-American guy just like them, you know, wanting to document and illuminate and highlight their culture. And I, I got the sense, and I still get the sense that they deeply appreciate that, and they're excited to uh, eventually see this work as a book. And me too. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think they, they really valued the work I was doing. That's the sense I got. Yeah, I mean, it's such a distinctive sound. Yeah. Do, do, do you go home and listen to it? <laughs> Don't listen to it at least at home? Yeah. Uh, or yeah. did you at one point? I, oh, I yeah. I mean, I think, you know, especially during grad school, I mean, that was most of what I was listening to. And again, you know, being displaced in some way far in Indiana, a part of the country and, and city and state that I just knew nothing about, you know, I wanted some connection to my roots and it was through screw music. And it was probably at that point when I became like a true screw head, just listening to those mixtapes nonstop and just soaking up all the culture, being on different message boards, trying to learn everything I could about my community. You know, it was weird, but it was, it kept me grounded in a certain way, so, oh yeah. You know, there's, there's that old debate about whether you study something from the inside or outside and yeah. am I kinetic. And um, how did you, did you give a lot of thought to that when you were in grad school? You did know, you think you were going to go back to Houston to study this for your dissertation? I wasn't sure, you know, um, my, doc, my master's thesis was kind of a general study of hip hop. It, well, it was on hip hop and death. But I kind of oh, surveyed. Really? Yeah, it was. You, it was you mean it, it, lyrics about death? In lyrics hip -hop? about death, connecting it, connecting it to some of the social problems within um, African American life around the country. It's just kind of examining that stuff through hip hop, and I just kind of spanned the country with that work. Um, but when it came time uh, time for my dissertation, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but it, it kind of just made practical sense to go back to Houston financially. <laughs> you know, I had a place to stay. I could live with my parents and you know, right there in the crux of the culture. But also just because, you know, I, I, there was something rich there that I wanted mm -hmm. to explore. You know, I wanted to learn about myself and learn about the people that I, I love um, and who I grew up with. So it just made sense to do it. Mm -hmm. And who, who were you studying with at Indiana? Who were your professors? Yeah, um, the chair, the initial chair, solo uh -huh. chair of my dissertation was Professor Portia Mossby um, in, in ethnomusicology who, you know, truly one of the landmark researchers of black popular music in the country. Um, eventually, Fernando Orjuela um, became my co-chair, mm -hmm. and I had worked with him for years, um, considered him a friend, and he, he joined my committee, kind of late in the, in the game, but helped out a lot. Um, Diane Goldstein was on my doctoral committee, uh, David McDonald in ethnomusicology, mm -hmm. and Sue Tui in ethnomusicology as well. Yep, that was mine. Team. That's a that's a great team. <laughs> kind of heavy, intense at times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when did you when did you finish at um, Indiana? Yeah, I defended in 2015 and then uh, submitted, did the revisions and stuff in 2016. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at what point did you move to Tennessee? Yeah, 
I moved to Tennessee in late 2015. Okay, and yeah. want to tell me what you I'm did like, in Tennessee? <laughs> Uh, I got there and for the first, you know, a couple months just worked on revisions. Then I eventually got a job as a program officer with uh, Humanities Tennessee, the State Humanities Council, um, where I was mostly working on youth programs. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, managed a or directed two writing workshops for youth and also I helped program the Southern Festival of Books, which was a oh, that's big, a big one. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. 30 plus years old, big giant uh, book festival in downtown Nashville. So those are my primary responsibilities. And I worked at Humanities Tennessee for about a year and a half. And then I went on, moved on to the Tennessee Arts Commission as a traditional arts specialist with the Folk Life Program. Mm -hmm. were you, did you overlap anybody or were you replacing? I was re, uh, no, uh, Bradley Hansen um, is oh. director of Folk Life down mm -hmm. there. He took over for Roby. Um, I took over for Dana. Uh, Everest Bohm down mm -hmm. there. Um, she had retired, I think, at some point, a few months before I joined, but um, I replaced her. She was a former traditional arts specialist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And was Tennessee, coming as a Texan, was Tennessee <laughs> sort of a whole new world? No. You know, Tennessee felt really, really familiar. Um, at least it you know, kind of was similar to my part of Texas. Texas is a giant state. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't even been to really to West Texas or North Texas at all, so I, know, I have no idea what's going on there. But Tennessee <laughs> felt like Houston, felt like Austin in some ways, so it was really familiar, you know. Similar cultural breakdowns, um, except the Hispanic population, a lot lower in Tennessee, but the traditions were very similar, and I enjoyed working there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are based in Nashville? I was based in Nashville, Not downtown bad, Nashville. Yeah. Not bad, not bad. It was it was great for the uh, the time I was there, you know. And I didn't want to leave, but you know, new opportunity, another part of the country opened up, so had to mm -hmm. jump at it. And so, and you're now where? I'm now in Washington State. I'm the director of the Center for Washington Cultural Traditions, which is um, a statewide folk life traditional arts program. And it's mm -hmm. a, a collaboration between the Washington State Arts Commission and Humanities Washington, the, the State Humanities Council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Been around for about a year now. I think it got started in March 2018. Uh, the founding director, Kristen Sullivan, uh, ran it until she uh, took a job as a museum director back out here in this way in Maryland. And um, I joined in January of this year, 2019. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts about doing this kind of survey folklore that um, could you sort of drop in and have to <laughs> start yeah. analyzing, especially in, in an area that's new, fairly new to you? It's hard work. <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, in some ways doing this work in Tennessee was a lot easier because, again, it was so similar to Texas, a much smaller state than Washington State, and just kind of, you know, easier to navigate, you know. East Tennessee has its own culture, West Tennessee has its, has its own, and Middle Tennessee is uh, Nashville <laughs> and surrounding areas, essentially. Um, but Washington State, I mean, goodness, just it's such an entirely different cultural landscape than any place I've ever lived. Um, you know, you have the whole native indigenous tribes there and there's many of them with their own distinct traditions and cultures and just figuring out how to navigate that is something exciting but something that's also difficult because you also have to be very respectful you know and that looks different ways depending on what tribe you're working with um, but you know it's hard work it's fun work you know it's still all new. I mean, I think the last few months for me have, has been a lot of administration. You know? Yeah, well, you've only been there, <laughs> what, only the, four? Yeah, well, three, three months, months, three yeah. months, you know, and I got there and I, the first thing I had to do was write a grant so that I would lock down in my office for a while. But the last, you know, a few weeks I've been able to get out and travel at least to the western portion of the state, you mm -hmm. know, learning about various native um, and other cultural traditions, and it's been fun. Everyone's been so nice and welcoming to me. Um, they, um, they're patient, <laughs> you know, I acknowledge that there's a lot that I don't know and they're willing to teach me. So it's been a, a really good transition and I'm excited about, you know, what's to come next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about doing, especially field work in African-American communities yeah. 
and you know how he, how you see that as an African American folklorist because unfortunately there aren't that many African American folklorists. I think yeah. increasing numbers, but there's still um, a, a real need for more people to from the community to document the African American community. Absolutely, you know, um, I grew up in what I felt like was a very rich culturally rich African American community down there in Houston. Mm -hmm. um, part of my family are from Louisiana. They brought the Creole traditions with them uh -huh. to the city and I grew up around other people, um, other Creoles in the area too. So I, you know, I think even as a youth, I understood that I was, you know, the African American culture, at least down in Houston, was just so amazing, incredible and worthy of exploration. You know, and then as I got of age and came of age and became a, a super hip hop fan, you know, mm -hmm. it also connected me to what I would consider to be folklore and traditional arts, you know. And, you know, I think, and that's why I said I felt like I decided to become a folklorist long ago because I just wanted to study myself and my community, you know, and I think it's vitally important. Um, there was a time in grad school when I had no idea what I was doing and, and, or what, what I wanted to be. <laughs> But I read Lost Delta Found, which was uh, about Lomax and uh, the work families, you know, collaboration oh. down in the Delta, mm -hmm. you know, and that really inspired me because I'm like, whoa, here's a black folklorist doing the work in the South, you know. And so, yeah, I mean, I wear my identity, you know, my race as a badge of honor when I do this work. Um, I feel like, you know, the, the people I've been working with, the folks I've researched have embraced me in part because of my race. They understand They understand that I know where they come from and I'm trying to work with them to highlight our culture and our traditions. And it's been, it's been great, you know, I wanna do more work in <laughs> the black community around the country even, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to work on some things that will allow me to do that. But um, we need more black folklorists, we need more folklorists of color mm -hmm. in general, yeah, you know, I who wanna study their own communities and even others, you know. We just need more diversity in the field and I hope that I can help bring some of that, yeah. What did your folks say when you decided, you told them you were going to be a folklorist? <laughs> um, different things. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, you know, my dad um, is a, kind of a renaissance man. He's a, a writer, um, a foodie, a, a chef, I mean, a playwright, stage manager. He's done many cultural oh, wow. things. So he, yeah. he kind of... And what's Understood. his name? Oh, Gary Wilkins, Gary Bernard Wilkins um, from Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing person. So, I mean, he, he embraced it from the jump, you know. My mom, you know, did as well. You know, I think she's a bit more practical, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, you know, it, it took a minute for her to understand, to, for her to understand where this could lead. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, they've been so, so supportive. Um, they let me come back as an adult and live in the, her, their house <laughs> <laughs> for free to do this work. So they've been immensely supportive. They support things that, you know, I do when I was down in Houston doing programs and stuff. They came out. They came to the slab parade. I mean, they've been amazing. They've been amazingly supportive my whole life, you know, and especially now as I'm a folklorist. So, yeah, they're mm. great. Tell me a little bit about the slab parade because... That struck, struck me as, um, the, were, were you the main driving force in that? Am I right thinking that you were? I don't know. I mean, I was, I, I, was, uh, I, I was the, the inspiration and, uh, you know, helped bring everybody together, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and what year was that? That happened in 2013 after about a year or so of planning, yeah. October 2013. So you started doing work <clears throat> with that community when? With the SLAP community? With my, right? um, maybe early... Late 2011, it was part of my dissertation field work. Um, in early 2012, I did a panel, I moderated a panel, mm -hmm. at the Houston Hip Hop Conference at the University of Houston on slabs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that panel kind of collected me to the larger slab world. And I just kind of ran with it. I started, you know, meeting everybody and, you know, doing just, you know, loose field work, you know, interviewing people at events and such. So that was early 2012. and. The parade happened about a year and a half later in October 2013. I know there's lots of, from what you're saying, both um, north side, south side um, competition, and were there people was, yeah. were people open to doing it or the parade? Just, yeah. Oh how yeah. How did you how did yeah. you manage to talk so many people into <laughs> into doing this? Yeah. Well, you know those tensions have largely subsided, and um, but a slab is a very insular community at times hard to access. How, you know. how many people are, in, are we talking about here that are involved? 
Uh, in the parade or just in the larger just slab the larger world? larger slab oh, world good. approximately. I have no clue. I have no clue just because it's, it's people live kind of undercover, you know, slabs come out at different events, you know, sometimes I'll see them in people's driveways, but most times they're like parked in garages, you know, undercover so people don't know, you know, they exist. Because again, these are vi valuable vehicles, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but I'd say, you know, I don't know, maybe in the city itself, several hundred, you know, maybe a thousand, maybe less, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Some people own slabs, you know, some people own one slab one day and then two weeks later they have a different car and I can't tell what happened to the other one, so I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was actually once we were able to fully access the community, people jumped on board. Um, we worked with community members, slab participants, to organize a larger community. Um, rapper Paul Wall, um, who's a rapper and, and also a slab writer, he was instrumental. This guy uh, named, his nickname is Miyagi. Miyagi? Uh, yeah, yeah, Miyagi, karate kid. He's, uh, he's a slab organizer. He has a, a, a magazine, a DVD series. He builds cars, he owns cars. I mean, he's truly like the community person for the slab community and he helped recruit people. Um, again, a, a group that I worked with a lot when I was doing field work, the Block Boys Click from Cloverland, they helped recruit people. So we really, we had community members working on the project and that's how we were able to get so much participation. And I think that's really important. They were able to really retain ownership of the parade while also, you know, kind of accessing the infrastructure of these large civic institutions. So it was a good partnership. And, and a lot of people showed up for the... I'm told uh, like 4,000 to 4,500 people wow. showed up that day. I mean, that was far more than I expected. Uh -huh. I mean, we held it in you know, the heart of the black community in Third, Third Ward, you know, at McGregor Park, which has long been a uh, hot spot for slab activity. We're in, I wasn't sure that you know, people from other neighborhoods and other communities and other you know, backgrounds would come Mm -hmm. But I, I know. I guess they were really interested and fascinated. They probably had seen slabs riding up, hogging the lanes, you know, clogging up traffic, and was curious about what they were. And I think that's why um, they came out. And it was beautiful. Yeah. So you had all these slabs parked, and were the owners right there? Yeah. Talk, talking about their vehicles. Yeah. So it started with a, a parade. We um, we had all the cars parked at a, what used to be a flea market maybe a couple miles from the main festival site. Mm -hmm. And they, in a long line, I think we had about 50 vehicles paraded down the streets um, in Third Ward, well, in mm -hmm. that area. Driving really slowly? Driving very slowly, you know, weaving, you know, doing the swinging and stuff. And they, yeah, paraded or proceeded into the park. And then, yeah, they were parked by color. So we had a red section, blue section, <laughs> black, purple, others. Yeah, and they were just out there you know, talking to folks who are interested in what they do. And at the same time, there was um, a, sort of a concert on stage featuring um, ESG, who I mentioned in my presentation, mm -hmm. and the Block Boys Click and other artists. So we had dancers as well. So we kind of brought various genres of black art together, you know, through Slab. So it, it was really cool. Really that that cool. is very cool. Yeah. For, I, you know, I didn't think to ask, but for Screw, mm -hmm. is are there, a dedicated dance style for Screw? Not really. I mean, it's such a, it's, it's not really a dance. Slow. It's, too <laughs> it's too slow to dance to. It, it, it's, a, it's such a slow music. Most people just kind of, what's the word, vibe to it. They just kind of, you know, sit back, relax, nod their head slowly, and just let it, it's calming music, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the, especially the, the slow rhythms really relaxes the body. So it's not really a dance music. Mm -hmm. More so a uh, music for relaxation, you know, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, far different than other hip-hop musical subgenres out there. I mean, slab is really just calming, relaxing music. Yeah. I mean, screw, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, 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 what's the future of it, do you think? Is it still going on? Is it modifying, transforming, going someplace that's a, else? That's a good question. It's, it's hard for me to you know, get a sense of what the future is going to look like. But I do know that, you know, younger artists from the city are still holding tight to the tradition. You know, they're using it in various ways. Even if they're not using it, you know, in their musical output, I mean, they use 
screw culture, slab culture in you know their imagery. So it'll be part of their album covers, or or um, if they do events in the city, you know they'll do it as screwed up records and tapes. So you know both musically and non-musically, these younger artists are embracing the tradition. So I, I think that means that they'll be around in the future. But you know we'll see. Hip hop changes. I mean that's what it's about. It's a youth culture, and you know youth bring you know young folks bring different kinds of energies and ideas to the table, and that's what we want. Mm -hmm. um, but I think since Screw and Slab has been branded as like a local identity, I think we'll continue to see it being pulled from in the future. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting, yeah. interesting stuff. Was it disrupted at all by the, uh, the hurricanes? Mm. And That's a good question. Not, not really. You know, um, like my neighborhood in uh, Hiram Clark and I think other parts of the south side, you know, weren't really damaged at all, thankfully, and that must have to do with the infrastructure of the city or something. It wasn't really disrupted. I think um, Hurricane Katrina, um, years prior, brought an influx of folks, artists, especially from New Orleans into the city, and I think you know that might have, you know, shifted the culture and sound a bit in a, in a cool way. You know, yeah. but otherwise, no, it wasn't, hasn't really affected. You were involved with that um, documenting Katrina and Rita in Houston Oh, I project. wasn't. I came oh, after you were, Oh, you did? Someone I came told right me you after went that. Uh, no, I work with Pat Jasper, but I, and, uh, I knew Carl, but I, mm -hmm. I came after they had completed that. Mm -hmm. Because that was sort of a... Oh, yeah, project. incredible project. Yeah, <laughs> inspirational, really, yeah. Yeah, and were you involved at all when... Um, with the occupational folk life project that um, Pat was doing on the Houston Channel. Uh, no, I actually left right before that, so I kind of <laughs> <laughs> I was right so in the middle. So you nearly yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, folk. Yeah, yeah. I mean, two incredible projects that she was doing. I think um, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I can't. I left right before they were doing that incredible work down there. I wish I could have been part of that. That's awesome. I certainly followed it from me. I went back to Indiana to finish up my dissertation. Mm -hmm. um, but, to, yeah. yeah, I wanted to get that done. <laughs> yeah, it's always a good idea. But I certainly followed what they were doing, and it was important work. Yeah. So I know you've just started at Washington, mm -hmm. but what do you foresee doing, or are you still doing surveys to figure out what you're Still doing surveys. I mean, uh, we have two program, two key core projects at the Center for Washington Cultural Traditions. Mm -hmm. One is uh, you know, your typical apprenticeship program where we are you know, trying to preserve um, rare and endangered or traditions that are unique to Washington by pairing up masters and apprentices who work together for a year. Our other project is what we call the Cultural Tradition Survey. Mm -hmm. And this is an awesome project where we identify a part of the state and for two years we just do a, a deep dive of ethnographic field work trying to just see what's out there, you know, traditions, traditional artists, oral histories. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of, yeah, occupy a part of the state for two years and do research and, and programming. So I, again, I think the center itself and myself included, mm -hmm. we're still just in the process of learning what's out there. Um, but you know, I have ideas for the center. I mean, I want to do a, you know, a sort of a magazine or journal, you know, I want to do more media-based projects. So, and that stuff will happen. But yeah, right now I think we're still in the learning stages. Now, what haven't I asked you that you'd like to <laughs> talk about? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't usually talk about myself. I'm usually on the other <laughs> side of this, so this is kind of weird for me. Um, I don't know. I think you might have hit we, everything. We I don't hit know. a lot of things. It's a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I think yeah. we'll probably have you back in a few years, and we could. Um, Ooh, yeah. Yeah. I'll have to do something else. Catch, do catch up on <laughs> um, what you've, you've done. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming, and thank you, uh, thank you for doing a great Bakken lecture earlier. And, oh, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. The turnout was incredible. I've been. I'm excited to talk about, you know, my city, the art forms that I, I love so much, and I'm just deeply appreciative that you had me out here to talk. So thank you. It's been our pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks.